Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Andrew Morrill, president of the Arizona Education Association. The association has provided professional services for and represented the views of teachers and other education workers since 1892. Andrew Morrill taught high school English for 16 years before being elected vice president and then president of the AEA, and he has generously agreed to share some of his experiences with us. I'd like to thank you, Andrew, for joining us today. Thank you very much. It's very good to be here. So education in this environment is incredibly challenging. We have uh, financial challenges. Um, there is a great debate going on right now about how education is to be provided uh, to meet the standards of excellence that the international, very competitive community demands. Talk about the role of the AEA in that debate, in that constellation of issues. Well, you're absolutely right. Uh, to endeavor to be in public education in the state of Arizona right now is chaotic. It is full of contradiction. What's interesting is there are those things that provide a very solid bearing. Um, I, I'm pleased to say that I think the AEA mission to keep the promise of quality public education is one of those markers. So our members come into public education on a pretty clear, firm path of conviction, personal passion. They want to create of the world uh, open doors for their students to shape their destiny. That drive to uh, create a world of possibilities for students. That's a bearing for the AEA. So the focus of the AEA is the good of the student. Uh, absolutely, and I think that gets lost a lot of times, but you can trace our beliefs, our actions, and certainly the words and actions of our members pretty directly to the best interests of students. And the thing is, our members understand how policies are gonna impact students. They understand how um, a mandate for third grade literacy or restructuring high school into three or four pathways that students can choose from will actually look by the time the policy travels all the way down across the state uh, through urban and rural settings and actually impacts students. So that's an exciting amount of expertise to have and, and it really um, it validates one of our core values which is teaching as an esteemed profession and not just teaching but all those roles that work with students. One of the questions that, that so often crops up is who gets to decide what is in the best interest of students? Because you have so many different constituents. Yes, you have policymakers and you have teachers and you have the people who drive the bus. You also have parents. You also have the students themselves. And there seems to be a very um, counterproductive discussion in which three quarters of the dialogue is really about who gets to decide and not actually talking about things that, that people agree on. It is better to have a student who is very equipped with linguistic skills, is very equipped with mathematical skills, is, understands the, and can connect the importance of behaviors to success. Yes. And we all agree on this. I've never met an individual who has been involved in education that, that does not agree in those on those essentials and, and others, but it seems that we get diverted away from those discussions and into esoterica uh, and, and into who owns the child. Well, it's frustrating to educators. It, it certainly is. And when you look at the level of discourse that the countries that are often cited as outperforming us are having, it's exactly as you said. In, in America, across the country, we're having conversations about the structure of governance and the, the governance authority for education of students. They're having, other countries are having conversations about the quality of instruction, the quality of content, the quality of curriculum. We're back here in Arizona deciding whether or not we ought to offer a public education to every student in Arizona. Uh, a study that came out a couple of years ago said, look, in the forefront state on parent choice for schools, let's not lose sight of the fact that 88 to 93 percent of the parents in Arizona choose year after year to send their students to their neighborhood traditional public schools. And the report went on further to say policymakers would be um, well served if they chose to focus more on raising the quality of the education, the investment in education, rather than creating escape mechanisms um, tuition tax credits, uh, vouchers or quasi-vouchers, 
which really have never been correlated with improvements in instruction, but we're strong on agenda. We're a little light on an orientation around what's in the best interests of students. In many respects, has this become a money game? Has this been a, become a, a, a Absolutely. resource game? In Arizona, a lot of what I hear is innovation is an excuse to cut funding further and further and further in the name of innovating education. So you're not saying that you are against innovation. Your issue as a former English teacher is the use of the word. Yes, it's, be, it's become it's the appropriated. It's the dilution, dilution of the meaning of the word. Innovation should mean a new and better approach. There are people using the word innovation in Arizona and they honestly mean a new and better and more exciting, uh, one would hope more engaging way. I always want to talk about what engages students more, but this idea that innovation really means cutting costs and cutting costs has served the political intent to um, reduce and reduce and reduce Arizona's investment in public schools. All one has to do is look at the last four fiscal years in this state where we heard time and time again about having to make the difficult decisions to balance the budget. When we cut base level per pupil funding two out of those four years. When we wiped out funding for all day kindergarten. When we wiped out funding for day to day instructional supplies that teachers use in their classroom. Let's assume those really were hard decisions. Okay, now we have a surplus and very few people down at the legislature and not the governor herself much. She's got a couple of pilot programs, some of which I agree with. But nobody's having a real serious conversation about reinvesting in our schools. So were those difficult decisions, or were we serving an agenda quite deliberately by cutting taxes and cutting taxes and cutting available revenue to the tune of about a billion dollars out of our public schools in the last few years, um, and then now saying, well, the money's not there. I hear what you're saying. What conceivable purpose can be served? What agenda could be advanced by um, depriving uh, children of educational experience. To undermine and in fact undo public education as a public enterprise and privatize the whole system. There are enormous profits to be gained and we know this from across the country. We know that the, there are national networks such as the American Legislative Exchange Council that bring legislation and in fact push legislation to privatize really everything and then they bring a pretty extreme agenda from out of state over and above the particular needs of a state and most of that has to do with privatizing. ALEC is not the only one but there's certainly one of the more elaborate networks to accomplish that. And the reason to not privatize education is? Because the, the public is best served by an educated, enlightened, civic body. Writers from, uh, writers all going all the way back to the city-states of Greece have opined that the best way to preserve the stability of a system is in a well-educated populace. Thomas Jefferson wrote very much that same thing. They may have had a different idea to more than 200 years ago about who ought to be entitled to that education, but a widely educated body was looked at as the first definition of national security. That doesn't mean we shouldn't have choices. We abound with choices of, of, of educational delivery in this state. Parents who want to send their students to private schools, have a right to make that decision and expect the best education they get. But we cannot and should not, and we do no service to American values in the attempt to privatize the entire system. So your point is not that it should be completely devoid of private elements. Absolutely not. Your position is not that it should be completely public or completely private. You would like to see a mix I think of, that, of different solutions. I believe um, and, and the AEA stands on this, that we need to create a great public school for every student in Arizona. That doesn't run counter to choice. If a parent chooses to send his or her students to private schools, absolutely, that's great. And they should, and they have a right to expect a quality education from that system. But we need to build a great public school for every student so that they have the access so that there's never, a, there's never a situation where a student simply has no other alternative but to go into a private education system. There isn't a private education system yet that does not end up costing parents something. When you move closer to the structure of private education, and we hear this from parent after parent after parent who go in. Um, in Arizona, it's possible to go in with a state subsidy, whether you call it an uh, empowerment account or a tax credit or something like that. 
those parents quickly find out that that's not the extent of the financial investment their family is going to be right. making. To build an education system that really exists for profit, think about that, means that you're actually changing the orientation from the student to whoever is way upstream receiving that profit. To the shareholder. Yeah, if it were to become the exclusive delivery system to education, and that's really what we're talking about, I don't think that's good enough for the students in uh, this country. Now, the AEA is an organization itself. Organizations yes, it have its own, uh, their own sensibilities, their own life, and organizations tend to uh, perpetuate themselves and, and try to grow and try to become uh, more stable, more solid, as opposed to weakening themselves. There is an element here in which this natural tendency of any organization can itself become an impediment to change and to changing itself. Could you talk about how you counter that natural tendency of becoming ossified right. and, and uh, sort of self-satisfied in past solutions? Well, I think it, it once again, it, uh, it's not glib to say that it really rests in our members, begins and ends in our members, because if you think about it, the AEA membership consists of those folks in dozens and dozens of education roles. Yes, classroom teachers, but in roles where people see the actual operations of school districts. Uh, take an example of somebody who provides technical support. Now, as technology changes and advances, somebody in, li in, somebody in the enterprise of supporting with technology the education enterprise is going to see where innovation can occur, where improvements can be made, where the latest innovations uh, could really help out and facilitate the best educational setting in our schools and in our districts. So uh, that's one role. There's a lot of work being done, whether you're talking about mathematics comprehension or literacy and, 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 um, and getting students literate at, a, uh, at an early grade level, especially concentrating on third grade mastery, seventh grade or eighth grade mastery of algebra. Uh, the science of teaching is progressing. I'm really delighted to say that because I think uh, a lot of folks believe they're doing educators a service when they talk about them as artists or magicians uh, or, or possessing a certain something that can't be taught. There is a level of inspiration. There is a level of art in teaching. And, and when you see a great teacher in action, you see that. But there is a science to teaching as well. And our members want that. We have new members coming in every year right out of our education preparation systems uh, in higher ed. They're being taught according to the latest research on how to engage students, engage students in their own learning, uh, unlock the mysteries of content areas, get students to apply their knowledge. The use of technologies, the use of Absolutely. communication. Absolutely. In fact, one of, the, one of the really more interesting um, uh, conversations going on in education right now is, is technology a discrete skill in and of itself that you sort of treat as a separate area, or is technology a function that exists in any academic area? So the technological possibilities, uh, the, the possibilities of incorporating technology in science and industrial arts is pretty obvious, but what about the use of technology in learning how to write really well? What about closing the distance between a writer in New York City and a classroom in Bisbee, Arizona? where through the use of technology, that writer could be in the classroom instructing students how to write. Collaboration in the development and deployment of content. We do a lot of work for uh, Wikipedia. And, Absolutely. And how about pools of educators from around the country all working on um, how to improve the writing of students? Free textbooks. Yeah. Well, it, it, or, or pooling resources from one state to another. Uh, to give teachers what they need, particularly, and, and this is not a shot across the bow at the legislature, because the legislature in Arizona has had to deal with some really serious challenges. And they deal with them again, year after year after year. But when resources begin to dwindle as a part of the state investment and the state general fund, you know, then we sometimes technology can fill in some of those gaps. You're also observing that your membership is not a monolithic whole. There is there are tremendous debates, new teachers debating with teachers of, of deep and long experience, um, uh, people who have different views of where the proper balance is in, in issues like technology or funding or the balance between STEM and non-STEM. 
the integration of content areas. It, what's what's really fascinating is to get a group of educators together. Take your language arts people, your history folks, your science folks. Get them in a room, lock them in, so mm -hmm. they can, and under the bare light bulbs, have them begin to discuss different theories of how to integrate content areas to maximize the meaning of what a student takes out of classrooms. And you will hear theory after theory. There, so few educators are satisfied with the status quo these days. The, the AEA cannot be satisfied with the status quo. I don't know anybody on our staff. I don't know anybody in our leadership. Certainly, uh, I, as president, our vice president, a former government teacher out of the Mesa district, our treasurer, uh, also an elected officer um, out of a, an elementary district in the area, we didn't come in because we were satisfied with the status quo. We, we didn't uh, choose these paths because we wanted to protect what was in place now other than the pieces of sanctity about the profession. We, we do need to protect those things that don't change, but a lot of those are back in the element of the commitment to students. The reason why people choose education in the first place rather than going into some other endeavor. Isn't it true that that those aspects are the same aspects that one would, the same values that one would have whether one is uh, a member of the teaching staff or the staff of a public school or private school, whether one is a member of, a, of the teaching profession in a for-profit environment or a non-profit environment. I it's think that you would find a great deal in common if you took educators in a public school and educators in a private school. The closer you get to students, the more clear the purpose is and the more the overlap and agreement. There may be differences, as I suggested, in teaching strategies and techniques, and let's hope that there are because that's how a profession advances itself. Look at uh, the medical profession. Look at um, any major profession. You're going to have people involved in the practice advancing the quality of that practice. What I would suggest to you is that the orientation must of necessity change in a private enterprise because maybe not at the classroom teacher level, but somewhere up the decision-making structure, it's going to start being about profit in the private sector. It has to be by definition. Look at the airline industry and the changes that are made in the quality of service on an airplane, the entire flying experience in the decades from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, and present day. The natural gravitational pull is to maximize profit and change the structure of what is delivered. You have more cost points now in a flight across the country than you did 20 years ago. You have the opportunity to be charged for more things than you did 20 years ago, 15 years ago. Now I take that example and I apply it to an education setting. In a private setting, how long will it be before of necessity we see multiple cost points? Maybe we can customize the education in a private delivery system based on what someone's willing to pay. There's a different orientation and I'm not suggesting for a minute those decisions would be made among those who are instructing students because that's not their orientation. But somewhere in the structure of a private company, those decisions get made. In a public education enterprise, you simply don't have that same orientation. Uh, so I think there are some differences, but I think the world might look very much the same at the level of the practitioner because they're involved in the education of students. And I'm very pleased to think that um, there still is a purity there. When it comes down to students, maybe there is a place where the dialogue is really about advancing learning, regardless as to the delivery mechanism, how do you advance uh, learning? If you were going to create a wish list, not tied to resources right now, of the changes that you would like to see to improve education for students, what would that wish list look like? Uh, it would center around differentiated learning. Within the class context, Teachers who can differentiate, find the means, the resources, and the opportunities to differentiate their instruction based on where, what they know a student needs and where they know a particular student is on the continuum are going to be more effective. Now, doesn't that also require a, a change in the model? You have children who are in one grade with different skills. So we teach everything by age which seems to be a nonsensical approach. We know that at a particular age, if you take a look at a class, everybody in that class will not have the same math skills. There will be students who are 
a year younger, who have better math skills, students who are a year older who have lesser math skills, and if you cluster those children in one math class, you might actually have a better math class, a better group of children who could actually learn more from a particular experience than if you try to place all these children into one particular experience and try to shoehorn them into as if they were generic elements. Right, and to be honest with you, there's a lot more of that differentiation going on than folks may be aware of because um, we certainly have that in high school uh, mm -hmm. where you, right. based on ability level, you'll see sophomores in with juniors and uh, at the same time you're trying to move folks, move students to the levels of attainment they need to be able to graduate. But um, there have been some exciting uh, restructuring conversations um, under the moniker of move on when ready, uh, a policy piece that did change at the, at the state level that do create pathways uh, that students can choose from in our high schools. And, and I think that we can get those to work and I think it will take a while to transition. At the elementary grades, um, you do still see some differentiation, but it is true that you're moving folks through uh, grade levels. Um, but the emphasis on standards is becoming much more pronounced than it has in the past. And standards are not a bad orientation. I, I think you're right in the sense that the structure does need to catch up with the philosophy. The philosophy is that standards attainment and the ability to demonstrate mastery of uh, knowledge points and skills really ought to be the orientation. It's going to take a while for the structure to catch up. There are things you can do to advance that and there are things you can do to slow it down. One of the things that would be nice, since we're not talking about finances in this part of the conversation, let's talk about inclusion of practitioners as we shape policy. One of the primary functions of the AEA is to provide groups of experts in delivery of education our educators and those who work around them, our administrators who are responsible for managing the delivery of education, put them in contact with policymakers. And the policymakers, and we have some. In fact, I just went through a process where a member of the Arizona House of Representatives was working on an evaluation bill. And to her credit, while that bill had a lot of problems with it at the beginning, she brought in educators and various stakeholders at four or five different meetings. And that bill ended up being a good deal better. It's not perfect, but it's a good deal better than it was. So it can happen. But boy, would we see policy shaped and set without the voice of educators, we're going to see a disaster when it hits classrooms, or we're going to see an effort to go back and backpedal and get the thing right in ensuing years. So and the second thing you want is consultation. Well, um, better. Better consultation. Better than consultation. Better as, somebody, consultation. as one of my members put it to me one time, um, Engagement? There is a big difference between being the proofreader as opposed to the co-author. Okay. We'd like to be the co-authors as much as possible. We will stipulate, our members will stipulate that we have uh, policymakers who are experts in the political process. We have very few legislators that have a direct experience as educators or working in school settings. There are, out of, out of 90 legislators, there are going to be some, but there aren't very many. So everybody has to give up a little bit of power in yeah. that, in that con construct. So the educators have to listen to these ideas, as distasteful as they might be, and the policy makers, uh, uh, others who have been dismissive of the AEA's expertise might have to accept some of that expertise? Well, there's an ambivalence about the union moniker in the AEA. You know, I tell people that the Arizona Education Association has DNA. It's a double helix. We are a union. Unashamedly, we perform several functions that you would attribute to a union. Advocacy of individuals, maintaining standards for the treatment of employees, things that we regard as the fairness, equity, and respect that's due everybody. And we are a professional association. I have members all the time tell me, I want this organization to reflect my love of my profession and my skills and expertise as a well-trained teacher. Yes, I belong to a union, but I want to belong to a professional association as well. I think that's a sacred pact that the AEA has between its members. So what happens is we'll disagree with a state policy 
and all of a sudden we're a union because it's easy to label a union as, you know, that monolithic block you were talking about and doesn't want to change. I don't think that's true. I think you can see example after example after example of where education unions, if you want to call them that in that function, have actually driven forward positive change. Do you know why the AEA was actually formed? No. The AEA was formed when a group of teachers banded together 120 years ago, we're actually older than the state, to demand new and updated textbooks for the instruction of their students. Now that wasn't somebody protecting the status quo. That was a student-oriented creation. And it's easy to stand outside an organization. We do this with institutions across the country. You know, it's easy to stand outside the legislature and throw rocks. It's easy to stand outside the, any U.S. department. But when you get up close to the AEA, you find some of Arizona's most committed and passionate educators, most committed and passionate adults who could be making more in the private sector, but choose to work for and closely with students. We believe we are pushing back on the status quo. Um, and, but we're doing it from a perspective of working closely with students. And uh, sometimes we provide a perspective that is inconvenient to the agenda of those who are setting policy. Well, this is such a complicated topic and I am so appreciative of you spending time helping us to understand your point of view and the point of view of your members. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.